From today, I'll be taking care of Sophia and Emma. My husband's words made my sister-in-law and niece smile triumphantly. I felt so frustrated, biting my lip hard. I know you don't like Amelia, but these two, who are my own flesh and blood, are more important to me. If you don't like it, let's get a divorce. In the end, he always puts his family first. I've been taking care of the house and raising our child all this time. And yet, he never helped me, not even once. And how he cares more about his sister. Just because I'm his wife doesn't mean I can't do anything. I will make sure he deeply regrets underestimating me. My name is Amelia, 35 years old. I live with my husband, whom I met during my student days, and our 7-year-old son. But I have a problem. I can't work. After tiring out from the social dynamics at my first job, I found it hard to work long hours. So, I work part-time while taking care of our son. I try to contribute to our household financially, but I quickly get exhausted and dizzy. Feeling guilty, I continued with my part-time job. Sorry, I would say handing over a small amount of money each month, but my husband always told me not to worry about it. He knew about my mental state and was kind enough to respect my wishes, despite suggestions from others to make me a housewife. I hated that my body wouldn't allow me to work. As our son started school, I began to find some breathing space. Eventually, I could even handle a full-time job and started finding fulfillment in my work. My husband and I were classmates. He was the class president, serious and always paying attention to me, who was often alone. Thanks to him, I was able to fit into the class without many bad memories. We started dating after he confessed at our graduation, and we got married when I became pregnant with our son, Richard. Richard has always been shy and hasn't quite detached from us yet, but his daily growth is a joy to watch. But one day, everything changed. My husband's attitude towards me shifted drastically. I had an inkling why. It must be about his sister. It happened one day when things at work were going smoothly. My husband's sister, Olivia, had a traffic accident. He has two siblings, a sister and a younger sister, making them my sisters-in-law. We only meet a few times a year, and my husband, having what you might call a sister complex, is incredibly kind to both of them. So, when Olivia had the accident, I was torn about going to her, but while Richard and I were waiting at home, my mobile phone rang. Hello? Ah, Amelia. It was James on the phone. When I was about to ask if I should visit Olivia in the hospital, he casually said, Amelia, you don't need to come to visit. Why not? It seemed strange not to visit my sister-in-law as his wife. When I asked, he replied, Because Sophia apparently doesn't want to see you. Olivia has fractured her leg and is currently with Sophia and little Emma. She definitely doesn't want to see you. He said this with a laugh, as if my feelings didn't matter at all. Sophia, my sister-in-law, has always been harsh with me, perhaps having a brother complex herself. My husband seemed indifferent to the situation, often telling me to step back because that's what Sophia says, and you, as my wife, should respect that. I was frequently told something along those lines. Hold on, is Olivia okay? She's fine, but you really don't need to worry about it, Amelia. But still, I could hear a heavy sigh on the other end. <sighs> Look, you're misunderstanding something. This is my family's issue, and it has nothing to do with you, Amelia. You really can be so clueless. He hung up without listening to me. Such a selfish man. Honestly, I've never been fond of my husband's family. Besides Sophia, my niece Emma also looks at me with cold eyes. Olivia, who is married, is sometimes nice to me. But the two of them, Sophia and niece, 
seem to see me as the one who took their brother away. And my husband treats them like princesses. Seeing my son looking worried, I hugged him gently and said, Let's eat, shall we? They were both tough on my son. Maybe it would have been better if he resembled his father, but Richard takes after me. That might be why they once asked, Is he really my brother's child? We married after having our child, which might have fueled their commands. My husband never reprimands them. Even jokingly, he coldly said that night, If what Sophia says is true, I'll divorce you. Of course, that's ridiculous. I always denied it with a smile. I never thought he would say it to our son, but then Richard asked me about it. Dad told me? He said that to his own son? That day, my husband didn't come home. I decided it was fine, had dinner with my son, and went to bed early. Hey, Amelia, why didn't you prepare dinner? Sophia made it for us. Yeah, Amelia, what's this all about? You're letting my brother eat this? The next day, my husband brought Sophia home. I was surprised to see them when I returned from work. She's in high school and seemed to be just back from school. I'm sorry, it was just the two of us yesterday, so I made something simple. That's no excuse, Sophia's here. Didn't you even think to prepare a welcome gift? It's not that easy to do something like that all of a sudden. Come on, Amelia, that's pretty harsh. I want cheesecake from the department store. I hadn't been told they were coming today. In a rush, I apologized, but Sophia, sizing the moment, demanded what she wanted. The department store's cake shop is always crowded. I knew that, and it was almost time for my son to come home. I'd like a chocolate cake. Thanks in advance. They waved me off, not listening to what I had to say. Before I could protest, my husband pulled me to the door, saying, Make sure you're back by 6 p.m., Sophia is here. And shut me out. No money, and less than 30 minutes left until 6 p.m. Getting the cakes in such a short time was impossible. Feeling disappointed by my husband and Sophia's selfishness, I got into the car. We're running late, I have a bus to catch in 10 minutes. I'm sorry, there was traffic. Amelia, there must be some back roads or something. Can't you think of anything? Exactly. They laughed at their own remarks. Even though I had already taken the shortest route through the back roads. I bit my lip and went to my room to change. But to my surprise, they started playing games. And then Sophia opened the cake box and said, Oh, there's another cake here. That's for Richard. Richard won't be back soon, right? He can get something from the convenience store. Happy to have permission from her brother, Sophia ate my son's cake. Don't they think about my son at all? Speechless and disgusted, I left the laughing pair in the living room and went to do the laundry. In the end, instead of leaving at 6 p.m., Sophia went out to eat with my husband. Then don't rush me for 6 p.m. After Sophia left, I talked to my husband about it, but he just frowned and said, My sister is hospitalized, and mom and my brother-in-law are also at the hospital. Can't you be a bit more considerate towards Sophia? It's not about that. Just don't rush me for 6 p.m. Ah, uh, you're so annoying. Actually, we plan to be back by 6 p.m. What are you, her mother? He plucked his ears annoyed and said, next time, make sure you cook properly. He hadn't even told me they were coming today. If I had known in advance, I would have prepared something. But my husband, who always puts his sister and niece first, would never listen to me. Since then, Sophia started coming to our house more often. Eventually, even my niece, Emma, began to visit. Emma, a middle schooler, was like an older sister to my son. So, when she came over, my son was always happy to join in their games. 
It's nice that my son has someone to play with, but I couldn't help worrying about how Sophia treated him. And my husband never reprimanded her, so before I knew it, I had become an unwelcome presence to my niece. Did you eat already? Yeah, mom said we should eat all together. That day was my son's birthday. I had told my husband in advance not to work late, and he even agreed, considering it was our son's birthday. But my husband, who apparently took half a day off, had taken our son to his parents' house. My sister gave me a present, my son said, seemingly unconcerned, but they had apparently already had a party there and were full. I had prepared a cake and made all of my son's favorite dishes for nothing. Of course, no one informed me, otherwise I wouldn't have cooked so much today. Mom was angry, saying, does Amelia care more about her work than her son? But I didn't know we were going there. You should understand that, or at least confirm it. It turns out the birthday party was Sophia's idea from a previous visit, and she had gotten permission from both of them. But I wasn't informed at all. Such an unreasonable. Sophia's selfish actions always end up affecting me. Like today, my husband scolds me as if I should have known something I wasn't informed about, making it seem like my fault. Lately, Sophia has been kinder to my son, it seems. So, my son doesn't dislike her anymore. And with his beloved cousin around, he's happy to go with my husband to his parents' house. Here, this is your birthday present from mom. I tried to cheer up and handed it to my son, but he looked puzzled. I got this from Sophia. What? The gift I had prepared was a game that my son had wanted. It was chosen in consultation with my husband, but Sophia couldn't possibly know about it unless my husband had told her. Looking at my husband, he seemed in a bad mood, saying, You duplicated the gift? What kind of mother does that? But we chose this together a while ago. My sister was worried about what to give, so I told her about this game. You should have read the situation better. You're failing as a mother, my husband said. I held back my retort, apologized to my son, and put the gift away. My husband seemed oblivious to how I felt and added insult to injury. By the way, mom and my brother-in-law won't be around for a while, so I've decided to take care of Sophia and Emma. What do you mean? They are having a hard time managing on their own, so I'll be responsible for their food and shelter. I need you to give up your room for them. He said it was already decided, instructing me to move out of my room. I hadn't heard such a thing before, and he even told me to move my room to the garage. My son seemed happy about them coming. It felt like I was the only unwanted one. I began to feel like my son was becoming more like their family. I had to change this, not for me, but for my son. The next day, I asked my husband when the two of them were expected to arrive. He didn't have an exact date, but gave me a rough idea. I began to dispose of and move things out of my room. My husband had said to get rid of anything unnecessary or move it. So, before the day came, I took action. Unfortunately, my husband was visiting his parents, leaving just my son and me. I moved my things from my room, disposing of what wasn't needed. When my husband returned, he was shocked. What the hell is this? What do you mean? Is there a problem? A problem? Look at this mess! I just did what you said moved and disposed of things. Right, I only moved my room. Everything else, unnecessary, I disposed of. I moved everything I bought out of the house. All of it, every single item I bought. Including the appliances necessary for housework, the TV, the washing machine, even the apartment is in my parents' name. So, I spoke to them and arranged to vacate the apartment in a month. My husband was trembling, but he was unaware of this. 
He wanted to live here as if it was his own, with Sophia and niece, but this place was originally where I lived. So, when he said to move and dispose of things, that's exactly what I did. Why are all the appliances gone? You said to dispose and move things. With that, I left the room. He called after me, saying the conversation wasn't over, but I ignored him. As he realized I was in my room, he came over, raising his voice. The conversation isn't over, why are you angry? I'm not angry, you told me to move my room, right? Oh, and I don't need this anymore. Holding the luxury watch I had given my husband, I spoke up. Despite only working part-time, I had been a secretary at my previous company and had saved up quite a bit, allowing me to manage even with shorter work hours. That's why most of the gifts I gave while we were dating were expensive items. Hey, that's mine, isn't it? Well, I bought it, so I don't need it anymore. Seeing that, I packed the luxury watch into a box. Inside the cardboard box were many clothes and branded boxes. My husband's face turned pale at the sight. Just then, the doorbell rang. It was, in a sense, perfect timing. Ignoring my husband's attempt to stop me, I walked to the front door. But this was just the beginning of my revenge. He needed to feel more pain to atone for what he had done to me. Opening the door, I found Sophia and Nice, both carrying several bags, seemingly planning to gradually move their belongings in. Welcome! I greeted them with a bigger smile than usual, causing them to look wary. Unperturbed, I invited them in. They were clearly unsettled by the state of the room. Taking something from my room, I approached them. Sophia, your birthday is coming up soon, right? Yeah, it is. Thanks for everything with Richard's present. Here, this is an early present for me. I handed her the box I had previously given to Richard. But I bought this. No, no, you must take it. Confused, Sophia watched as I cheerfully insisted. This is something your beloved brother and I chose together. You have to accept it or he'll be sad. Indeed, the item intended for Richard was chosen by my husband and me. When I conveyed this, Sophia's face turned red with embarrassment. You have to take it, it's my way of saying thanks. As I spoke sarcastically, she opened and closed her mouth, unsure of what to say. Sophia, perhaps angered by my attitude, started crying. Hearing this, my husband rushed in, his face ashen. How can you behave like this towards a high schooler? I'm only doing what Ava and Olivia permitted. What? Mom and sister? Indeed, I had spoken to Ava and Olivia about the situation. I told them how I was never informed about anything regarding their family, including my son's meal gatherings. Upon hearing this, they were furious. They were appalled by Sophia's childish behavior and my husband's immaturity, despite being an adult, and they were unaware of his plan to bring Sophia and niece to our apartment. They supported my plan. Although I hadn't interacted much with Olivia, she understood my situation and even encouraged me playfully to go ahead with my plan. I know you don't like them, Amelia, but these two, who are my own flesh and blood, are more important to me. If you don't like it, let's get a divorce. Thank you. Then, let's divorce. What? My husband, evidently shocked that I didn't object, stared in disbelief as I presented him with the divorce papers I had prepared beforehand. Wait a minute. Ignoring his panic, I told him that the apartment was being sold, that I had moved my belongings to another apartment, and that I had obtained approval from his family. You want a divorce, right? I'm happy to oblige. Oh, and please sign quickly. I need to catch the 6 p.m. bus. Wait a minute. After some frantic behavior, my husband eventually acquiesced and signed the divorce papers. 
I was finally free. He looked dejected and asked, What about Richard? I've already discussed it with him. No way. When I talked to my son that day, he readily agreed to come with me. I was relieved when he chose to stay with me. I was finally free from them. We now live in an apartment near my parents' home. Later, after recovering from her hospital stay, Olivia came to visit with gifts and apologies. Despite being confined to a wheelchair due to the accident, she made the effort to come to my apartment to apologize on behalf of her daughter and Sophia. However, I never felt any animosity towards her. She understood the feelings of being a daughter-in-law and had given me advice on several occasions. It was just my husband and Sophia that I disliked. Of course, I never want to have any dealings with my ex-husband and Sophia ever again. According to her, my ex-husband and his sister were kicked out of the apartment and had to return to their parents' home. However, Ava, having heard my side of the story, refused to let them stay, citing their previous talk of living together as a reason why it didn't make sense for them to return. My former niece, scalded by Olivia after her return, now occasionally helps Richard with his studies as a tutor. I'm still attending psychiatric treatment and, upon consulting with my doctor, managed to seek legal advice. My former sister-in-law had apparently complained about me being sloppy and disorganized to other relatives, which, after seeing her message, encouraged me to take action. As a result, my ex-husband faced allegations of moral harassment, and after consulting with the family court, I was able to claim a limony. She sold all my stuff, that jerk. At the family court, my ex-husband, now jobless, shouted angrily at me. However, since the items were purchased by me, they weren't technically his. Despite attempts to calm him by the lawyers, I had a plan. I could return them, but your actions alone could be seen as moral harassment. What? But those things were... You always said I was slow and dull, right? Then, returning them might take some time. I deliberately spoke in a cheerful tone, using his own words about my supposed slowness against him. My ex-husband, realizing the situation, fell silent with a red face. His financial difficulties were of no concern to me. I was satisfied just to have shown him the consequences of his actions. In the end, he was ordered to pay alimony for moral harassment. Sophia and ex-husband couldn't return to their parents' home and, as the rumors spread to his workplace, he ended up working multiple temp jobs while living with Sophia. They're together, which they probably like, but I've decided to have nothing to do with them anymore. And Ava agrees. I now live with my son. Since the alimony was settled, I felt more mentally relaxed. What's more, I'm happy that I've been able to return to my previous job as a secretary, even if it's part-time. Olivia and Ava still worry about me and occasionally check on Richard. Although I had intended not to have any contact with my ex-husband's family, my son loves these two, so we meet everyone except my ex-husband and Sophia. My dream is to marry someone like my mom and cherish our family just like mom and I do. When my son said this, I was moved to tears. Looking forward to such a happy future, I plan to build a happy home together with my son. My name is Kayla. I graduated from college five years ago. I moved out and started living on my own when I began college. That's because my father was a bit of an eccentric person. I was his first child, but he had hoped for a boy. When I was born a girl, he didn't even try to hide his disappointment and was hard on my mother. Even as I grew up, my father never accepted me as his daughter and hardly showed me any love. I have no fond memories of my father from my childhood. All I remember are his cold eyes and the many words he used to reject me. My mother protected me and showered me with love. 
even taking on the role of my father. I was able to endure my father's harsh treatment thanks to her. Six years later, Emery was born. My father was disappointed again that it was a girl, but something changed, and he started to adore Emery. However, his attitude towards me remained the same. It was clear that he treated Emery and me differently. As I went through elementary, middle, and high school, I was treated by my father as if I didn't exist. On the other hand, Emery was praised by my father for even the smallest things, and he bragged about how cute she was like a little doll. In contrast, the way he would sigh and say, Oh, but Kayla was quite a shock to me. My mother would comfort me, saying, Kayla is different from Emery, but she's very cute too. But it didn't resonate with my shattered confidence. When I went to college, I decided to move out and live on my own. I loved my mother, but I had no feelings for my father, who showed no interest in me. I couldn't bear to live with him any longer. He reluctantly paid my college admission fee, but declared that he would not help with tuition or living expenses. He said that if there was any money, it would be used for Emery. I had to hustle to make ends meet through scholarships and part-time jobs. My college life was consumed by studies and work, with no room for the typical joys of youth. I had almost no connection with my family during my student days. My mother would contact me occasionally, but there was no communication from my father or Emery, and I didn't reach out to them either. When I was job hunting after graduation, the most important thing for me was the salary. I had to repay half of the scholarship I received, and I knew from my part-time work how important income was. With a recommendation from my senior professor and my hungry spirit in the interviews, I secured a job offer from my first choice global consulting firm. My mother was thrilled as if it were her own achievement, but my father and Emery showed no reaction. I thought I was prepared for that, but it still left me feeling lonely and empty. Reaching a state of enlightenment isn't so easy, is it? I threw myself into my work once I joined the company. I think I needed a place to channel these lingering feelings of frustration. Thanks to that, I learned my job faster than any of my peers. With support from my seniors, I was able to satisfy major clients and secure ongoing contracts. I was steadily climbing the ladder of success. My income was rising in proportion to my achievements. Five years into my career, I had grown into a leader, trusted with multiple projects. During this successful period at work, I received a call from my father, who I hadn't heard from in years. Your mother's had an accident and is paralyzed on one side. I want you to come home and take care of her. You're probably just loafing around, so I'll give you a task. I was shocked to hear that my mother needed care after an accident. I hadn't told my father about my job, so he had assumed that I was unemployed and useless. But more than that, I was worried about the misfortune that had befallen my mother. I didn't want to return home, but my desire to help my beloved mother was stronger. I immediately applied for remote work at my company. Fortunately, my global company was ahead of others in allowing telework, and the environment was in place. I decided not to cancel the lease on my current apartment, thinking it might be best to keep it, even though it seemed wasteful to pay rent. So, I returned to my family home, taking only what I needed. It had been about nine years since I left home to go to college. My mother's condition was more serious than I had thought. She was paralyzed on one side and couldn't walk on her own. Luckily, her mind was unaffected, and she could speak normally, but her immobile body looked very painful. I confronted my father about why he hadn't contacted me for the several months since my mother's accident and her home care, but he was as indifferent as ever, saying, Telling you wouldn't make her better. I called you this time because I had no choice. Indeed, I, not being a doctor, couldn't do anything to help my mother recover but I couldn't believe a father who wouldn't inform his daughter about her mother's plight. Months after my mother became immobile, the house was in a terrible state. Clothes were strewn everywhere, dishes were piled high in the sink, and the rooms were covered in dust and garbage. My mother's care had been completely neglected, and her back was covered in bed sores. I had no expectations of my father, but Emery was supposed to be living there too. What had Emery been doing? The answer became clear with her first words. I can't do housework, so I can't take care of mom either. I'm relieved now that Kayla's back. Emery, spoiled as she grew up, had become a self-centered person 
who couldn't do anything around the house, I started by cleaning the rooms. The mess and the dirt that had accumulated over several months couldn't be fixed in a day, and I spent nearly a week on this task. It took me that long because I had to care for my mother during that time. My mother kept saying she was sorry to have me care for her, but I cheerfully and energetically attended to her, hoping she would get better. While I was engaged in housework and caregiving, neither my father nor Emery did anything to help. Far from helping, my father would complain. The food tastes awful. What are you slacking off for? You're clumsy at taking care of your mother. You have plenty of time since you're just loafing around. Do it properly. To him, it was only natural that I should do the housework and caregiving. Emery would say, Kayla, wash my clothes for me. I'm wearing them to school tomorrow. Kayla, tea please. I was treated like a servant, especially by my father, who was convinced I was a neat. Indeed, I was mostly shut in my room doing telework, housework, and caregiving. But to my father, it seemed like I was just as shut in, even though telework was my main work mode. I still had to go to the office regularly. When I returned home, my father would sometimes be standing at the entrance, accusing me angrily. You're just a shut-in neat, and yet you're gallivanting around. Take care of the house properly. His angry voice echoed throughout the house. From behind him, Emery would add, Uh, you're really useless. Just going out to play? I was exhausted. Every time I left the house to go to work, I would be met with insults and sarcasm from the two of them. I had made it a habit to go to my kept apartment and relax alone, tidying up the room before returning home. I was truly glad I had kept this room. The unreasonable demands and harsh treatment from my father and Emery grew stronger day by day. You must have some savings. Even if you're a neat, contribute money to the household. My father, who worked me so hard, was now demanding money. I'm going on a day trip with my friends, so give me some funds. Emery, who did nothing around the house, was begging me for pocket money. What was I to those people? Not a daughter, not a sister. The painful days continued. One time, Emery screamed. My ring is gone, Kayla. Do you know where it is? Of course I didn't know anything about Emery's ring, and I had no interest in it since our tastes were different. When I told her I didn't know, she stormed into my room. I was slow to react to Emery's sudden action, and I was a beat late in following her into the room. When I arrived, I heard Emery's triumphant voice from inside. See, here's the ring. Kayla stole it, didn't she? Emery came out of the room with the ring, pointing her finger at me and shouting. There was no way that thing was in my room. I immediately realized that Emery had set a trap. It was harassment for not giving her pocket money. Emery quickly tattled to my father, who had just come home. Stealing Emery's things. You're truly pathetic. I don't remember raising a daughter who would steal. No matter how much I explained, my father wouldn't believe me. Emery added, We don't need a thief, Kayla, do we? If it weren't for your mother's care, I'd kick you out right now. No some shame. And so I was labeled a thief. One evening, at dinner, my father suddenly became furious for reasons unknown. You useless person. Can't even do housework properly. Making food like this. Still not contributing money to the house. Do you think your current work is enough? You're just a shut-in who gallivants around. I can't stand it anymore. I'll destroy your plaything. My father yelled and headed towards my room. My plaything? My computer? That's my essential work tool. If it's destroyed, it would be a disaster. I followed my father to my room and protected my precious work companion, just as he was about to lay hands on my computer. Emery was watching from behind, smirking, around the time my mind and body were reaching their limits. My mother passed away peacefully. She was always grateful for my care and was pained by the way my father and Emery treated me. I felt my strength draining from my body. My heart was so shattered that I forgot to cry. Father and Emery were not only tearless, but acted as if a nuisance had been removed. Though we were in the same tearless situation, our reasons were 180 degrees apart. After my mother's funeral was quietly conducted, my father called me into the living room. Your mother's gone, and you're no longer needed. I want you to leave immediately. 
We don't need a useless neat who can't even contribute money to the house. I had a feeling he would say something like this, but I never thought it would actually happen. I asserted my hard work up to now, but my father was adamant about me leaving. Emery added, Are you planning to stay here and be a neat? You're such a parasite. A parasite, that's a good word. You're like a tick or a flea. I felt dizzy from the barrage of harsh words. Also, about your mother's inheritance, you must renounce it. There's nothing for you. I hadn't thought about my mother's inheritance at all. The love I received from her was enough. It was something I had never received from my father or Emery. I don't want it. I'll renounce it, and I'll leave, okay? I'll leave right away. I asked for one day's grace to pack, and immediately began preparations. The next day my father said, Are you ready to move? Hurry up. I'm leaving. I'll have nothing to do with this house or you two anymore. Goodbye. I loaded my packed belongings into the taxi I had called. I realized anew how few possessions I had. Returning to my parents' house after nine years and leaving again. This time, I would never return. I had spent a hollow time realizing the reality of my father and Emery. But I was satisfied that I could help my mother. I returned to my kept apartment and applied to switch from telework to regular work. However, I was glad I had kept the room. My previous daily life returned. No, I worked even harder than before. I wanted to forget everything. About three months later, I received a call from my father, whom I had cut ties with. I didn't want to answer, but I reluctantly picked up the phone. Hey, what's this promissory note? It's an outrageous amount, isn't it? Are you a neat? How much are you earning a month? Frantic, my father began firing questions one after another. Of course I'm not a neat. On the contrary, thanks to my dedication to my job, I believe my income is considerably higher than others my age. And I had quite a bit of savings accumulated from working. When I first started caring for my mother, I bought various equipment and tools to make her environment a little better. Knowing that the household was financially strained, I also contributed to the monthly living expenses to ease my mother's burden. Yes, long before my father demanded money for the house, I had been contributing. I even paid for Emery's tuition to alleviate my mother's worries. My mother, grateful for my various expenses, insisted on making it clear and had a promissory note drawn up between us. My financial support had amounted to a considerable sum, and that promissory note had overlaid my father and Emery in the form of a negative inheritance. As for me, I was exempt because I had renounced the inheritance. In other words, the two of them had to repay all the loans from me. After hearing the full explanation from me, my father was speechless. He screamed that he would also renounce the inheritance, but the two of them had already touched part of it, so they had no right to do so. Work hard and pay it back properly, and don't contact me anymore. I've cut ties with you. I ignored my ranting father, hung up the phone, and blocked his calls. Afterward, my uncle, my mother's brother, also suddenly caused great confusion for my father and Emery. I had met my uncle for the first time in a while at my mother's funeral, and after he noticed something was off about me. I confided everything to him. The family home was owned by my uncle, and my mother had been renting it. The right to rent passed to the two of them through inheritance but my uncle refused to renew. Legally, tenants had the upper hand, but they couldn't stand up to my uncle, and due to their misdeeds, they ended up having to leave. My father, who had been on the restructuring list at his company for some time, was finally selected and had to leave. Emery couldn't pay tuition and had to drop out, even though graduation was near. Father and Emery, who lost their home and jobs, moved into a small apartment. Most of my father's retirement money went to repay the debt to me. It would be difficult for him to find a new job at his age. Whether Emery, a college dropout, can find a decent job is also questionable. The two of them were becoming neats in a dark, small room. Thanks to my ambitious return to work, 
I succeeded in acquiring new clients and launching new projects. I was promoted to the first female division head. It's a bit late for a global company to have its first female division head. I am striving to nurture the next generation and make the company more open. My name is Layla. I'm 28 years old. I have been married to my college sweetheart, Henry, for almost three years now. For the first two years of our marriage, we were both working, but I'm currently on a leave of absence. This story started two years ago when I went to my husband's parents' home for the first time to formally greet them as their son's wife. At that time, my sister-in-law was still living at home, and for some reason, she insisted on being present during my visit. I initially appreciated her presence since I knew I would have to meet her eventually, and it was convenient to get the introductions done all at once. The conversation with my future in-laws went smoothly, but all of a sudden, I hate living with strangers. Even though you're Henry's wife, you're still a stranger to me, so don't ever consider living here. So my sister-in-law declared. We had been searching for a home somewhere between our workplaces and never had any intentions of moving in with them, so her words left me stunned. Also, my parents are very nice people, but don't think you can take advantage of them. When you have kids and decide to go back to work, don't expect them to babysit, and don't visit this house too often. She continued. Her words felt like an unwarranted attack, especially considering my husband and in-laws were present. They immediately reprimanded her and apologized to me so profusely that it was as if they were ready to get down on their knees. Seeing them apologize only seemed to fuel her anger, and she continued to rant, bringing up issues we had never even considered. It was way too ridiculous, and it turned my initial shock into a calm astonishment. If you feel that way, it would be better to call off our marriage, I said firmly, and then left, though my husband and his parents kept apologizing to me. Later, a meeting was arranged that included both sets of parents, my husband, my sister-in-law, and myself. However, my sister-in-law's hostile attitude toward me didn't change at all. Realizing this situation was not good for anyone, my in-laws decided it was best for her to move out. She had a job and earned enough to live independently, so she was essentially asked to leave her parents' home. Her new place was close to her workplace, in an area I had no connection with. My husband and his parents seemed to make an effort to avoid running into her, even at their home. She was conspicuously absent from our wedding, feigning illness. Since then, we never saw her face to face, so I could hardly remember what she looked like. I thought our relationship would continue like this, but she got engaged, which was an unexpected development. As it turns out, her fiancé was one of my father's employees. My father works for a fairly large company and has many subordinates, so I guess this sort of coincidence isn't impossible. I wish it hadn't happened. My sister-in-law was nearing 35 and had been eagerly marriage hunting. She finally caught a younger, good-looking, high-profile man, and it seemed to have sent her into a frenzy. Despite her previous hostility towards me, she started contacting me so frequently. She said things like, We're close sisters, right? I've always cherished you as a sister. I had never had a decent conversation with her, let alone been close. But as I tried to respond vaguely to avoid confrontation, she took it as a sign that she was on the right track and started contacting me even more often. We've always been close, and let's continue to be close. Can I visit your parents' house with my fiancé? I want to get along with your family too, so she said. When I received a call from my sister-in-law, I recorded it and let my husband listen. What the heck is she saying? That rotten sister of mine, he said, thoroughly exasperated. He informed his parents about the situation since things might have gotten heated if I said it. Just as we were, my father-in-law was also thoroughly exasperated. After all the rude things you've said, what is this nonsense you're spewing now? If you think about what you've done calmly, you wouldn't be able to make such calls. He said this to his daughter. 
Thanks to his intervention, I stopped receiving direct calls from my sister-in-law. However, in exchange, she sent me a thick letter. I wonder how she took her parents' anger. The letter was filled with unnecessary phrases like, We are close sisters. I'm glad you married Henry. I absolutely want you to come to my wedding. With nothing else mentioned. She even included a folded pamphlet of her wedding venue with a sticky note that said, It's more luxurious than where you guys had your wedding, so please enjoy it. She didn't have to do all this as I was already planning to attend her wedding. I was going to respond to the invitation saying that I'd be present. I'd congratulate anyone who's getting married, regardless of who they are. I wouldn't want to do anything as shameful as what my sister-in-law did two years ago. I'm an adult with common sense. However, my attendance was just a plan. By the time of my sister-in-law's wedding, I'd be close to my due date, so I couldn't predict how things will go. It might end up with just my husband attending, without me. My in-laws had kindly told me not to overexert myself, and I planned to take their advice. After all, I was on maternity leave, and my sister-in-law should know this from my in-laws. Also, it seemed that my father received an invitation from the groom's side, as he was considered a superior. He said, I'm not his direct boss, but it's not that I'm totally unrelated. And he's the man marrying Henry's sister. I intend to go, but I decline to give a speech. And there's the issue with the sister. You don't need to attend, he said to my mother with a slightly troubled tone. According to my mom, the groom had asked my dad to give a speech at the wedding reception. My father is in an executive position. The groom, at 30 years old, hadn't even managed to become a team leader yet so he was in no position to even send an invitation to my father, let alone ask him to give a speech. Around the office, people seemed to talk about him like quite audacious and some nerve. According to what I heard from my in-laws, my sister-in-law had egged on her fiancé, saying, he's not just a boss, but a family since he's the father of my brother's wife. You don't need to hesitate. If we could get him to give a speech for us, it's a fast track to promotion for you. You can one-up the other employees by having an executive in the family. She seemed to have pushed her fiancé into this, and I couldn't help but worry about his future, though I'd never met him before. Workplace relationships and hierarchies aren't as simple as she thinks. She was the type of person who thought her values and opinions were justice, and if you were not the type of person who could firmly say no, you might be swayed by her. Before my sister-in-law's wedding, we had a discussion with my in-laws, and we decided that my husband would attend without me. And from my family, only my father would attend. My sister-in-law seemed very unsatisfied, but perhaps fearing that insisting on her opinion would result in neither my husband nor my father attending, she reluctantly agreed. And then came the day of the wedding. I was staying at my parents' house to prepare for my delivery, and my mother, who had also decided not to attend my sister-in-law's wedding, was taking care of me, as my labor could begin at any moment. We hadn't particularly talked about it, but I imagined her reception must have started about then. As I was relaxing and sipping my tea, my smartphone rang. It was from my sister-in-law. I wondered, isn't she in the middle of her reception? As I answered the call, Why aren't you and your mother at the ceremony? It's utterly rude that you said you'd attend and then not show up. A hysterical voice ranted. Hold on, we had agreed that we wouldn't attend, didn't we? I retorted. How dare you, as a sister-in-law, not do as your husband's sister says? You're basically a servant to the family you've married into, so what gives? It's bizarre how my parents and Henry are so compliant with you. And now my fiancé is in a bad mood because of it. My response only fueled her rage. Her ranting continued, and I managed to stop myself from saying I couldn't care less. I moved the phone away from my ear and listened to her tirade. My mother wore a puzzled expression, hearing the voice leaking from my phone. It appeared she had called during a break in the reception, and after a while, my sister declared, I don't have much time right now, but you'll have to take responsibility for not attending the ceremony, and then hung up. 
Despite us informing her beforehand that we wouldn't be attending, she had the audacity to tell us to take responsibility. This perplexing statement wasn't the cause, but shortly after this call, my labor started. My mother grabbed the prepared bag for the hospital, called a taxi, and contacted my husband while we headed to the hospital. My mother was an ex-midwife, and she knew what to do. The baby won't be born immediately, so you can come to the hospital after the reception. You'll have plenty of time. She even instructed my evidently flustered husband over the phone. After hanging up with my husband, my mother said, It'd be a hassle later on if Henry also had to leave the reception early, right? With a mischievous smile. The delivery took longer than anticipated, lasting close to half a day, even after my husband, in-laws, and my father arrived. Our first child, a girl, was born at dawn. Exhausted and disheveled, I heard my husband say, crying like a child, Thank you. What a beautiful baby girl. Let's cherish her to grow up, kind and thoughtful. My in-laws and parents were all overjoyed. I only heard about the aftermath of my sister-in-law's wedding and reception once I had settled down at home after I got back from the hospital with my daughter in my arms. It seemed it was quite a serious event. This serious has a negative connotation. Despite having discussed everything meticulously beforehand, my sister-in-law had assumed in her wedding high mind that her brother and his wife, as well as his in-laws, would surely attend the wedding ceremony. It appeared she hadn't informed her fiancé about the decisions made in the family discussion, and also assured him, Henry's father-in-law will accept to give a speech, so it's all good. My father had personally declined to the groom, suggesting that he should ask someone else instead. The groom had even proposed asking his direct superior, or an uncle. I'm sure he will accept it if I ask through my brother's wife. I had no idea how she had convinced the groom that my father wouldn't accept to give a speech while he had directly declined it to him. It was reiterated in front of my sister-in-law during the family discussion that he wouldn't do it, and yet no alternative prearrangements had been made. Because of my sister-in-law's actions, the ceremony and reception proceeded without a main speaker. The groom, who was supposedly overjoyed that an executive had accepted to give a speech on his wedding, was indeed thunderstruck. I assume he felt utterly embarrassed in front of the invited guests. Just picturing the bride and groom seating in shock makes my spine chill, even though I wasn't there. Naturally, the groom must have been upset and confused. He probably complained to my sister-in-law too. The ever-deteriorating atmosphere at the venue caused my anxious sister-in-law to call me during the break to change her dress. The groom gradually noticed more lies by observing the guests invited by my sister-in-law, and after the reception that was filled with tense mood, he suggested postponing their still uncompleted legal marriage registration. The lies my sister-in-law told her fiancé included, I have a great relationship with my family. I am very close to my brother and his wife. That's why your boss, who was my brother's father-in-law, will support you. I graduated from a prestigious university and have a responsible job at a major company. I am a happy person, still surrounded by the good friends I made at the university. And so on. As you might guess, all of these were lies. My sister-in-law had been increasingly alienated within the family, even before she started spewing offensive remarks at me. And her relationship with her brother, my husband, was far from good. It goes without saying that my relationship with her was not good either, so there was no reason my father would favor my sister-in-law's fiancé. As I'd mentioned before, the groom didn't seem very competent at his job, so promoting him out of nowhere would indeed create an odd atmosphere within the company. Additionally, my sister-in-law's highest education level is high school. After graduating by the skin of her teeth as she was partying around without attending school properly, she was in a state of unemployment, occasionally doing some part-time work. After her 30s, she was hired as a part-time employee through the connections of her father. 
And of course, she has never had a responsible job. Even though she managed to commute without being late or absent, she was a burden who could not handle phone calls, making copies, or checking emails properly. There's no way such a person would have friends. Even if there were some acquaintances when she came across in town, they were not someone close enough to invite to the wedding, so she used a dispatch service to fill the seats. Thus, the speeches made by such so-called friends sounded obviously fake. At a ceremony to celebrate a new beginning, it was unlikely that there would be any reconciliation between my sister-in-law and her fiancé after so many lies and secrets had been exposed, no matter how hard she tried. Currently, it seems that discussions with the lawyers are still ongoing. After hearing all of this, I remembered the words my husband had said when our daughter was born. Let's cherish her to grow up kind and thoughtful. Now, I realize these words had a very deep meaning. Neither I nor my parents have any intention of getting involved in whatever resolution my sister-in-law comes to. Even my father-in-law said firmly, That's fine. I don't want any weird influences on my granddaughter, so I'd rather you don't get involved. I know it's not easy to live without any lies or secrets, and there are gentle lies made in care for one another. I believe they work fine, as long as they are based on proper common sense. Come to think of all the things my sister-in-law had said and done, I even take them as a great lesson to learn what not to do. That's how I deeply feel now. My husband and I are about to start raising our first child. We are discussing that we want to cherish and nurture her so she can grow up to be a person who can be proud of herself, enjoy spending time with many friends, without causing trouble to others, and lead a happy life. I think it would be delightful if we could also grow as parents in the process. What era are you living in that you expect us to have a relationship with distant relatives? I've been meaning to tell you this, but we don't want you around. My eldest son just had his first child. My eldest son's wife bluntly told us off when me and my husband went to visit our grandchild. But a month later, she showed up at our doorstep looking a mess. My baby is sick. At those words, I responded with what she had once said to us. That's not our grandchild. And is only your child, right? I struggled trying to hold back my laughter, seeing the shocked look on her face as she turned bright red. My name is Sandy Wilson, 73 years old. I've been married to my husband, Jim, for 45 years. Back then, I was 27. After graduating from high school, I met my husband at our workplace. Jim was two years older than me. Until then, I had only seen him as a colleague, but he insisted on us dating and eventually we ended up together. I'm more of a reserved type and I had no dating experience with men until I met my husband. Back in the day, the average age for a woman to get married was 24. My friends, relatives, and my younger sister got married in their early 20s. Seeing everyone around me getting married, I felt pressured to get married. I even had a blind date once, but it didn't work out. I worried I might end up alone for the rest of my life, but I always believed that my career was something that no one could ever take away from me. So, I was committed to my career. Thanks to that, I was earning a decent salary by the age of 27 and was involved in various projects. I believe I was able to earn respect from my colleagues too. Perhaps my boss gave me various opportunities thinking I wouldn't get married. When I announced that I was getting married to Jim, they were quite surprised. Back then, it was common for a woman to quit working after getting married, but I was asked to stay at the company and we became one of the few dual-income couples, which was rare back then. Soon after we got married, I gave birth to our first son, Chase. It wasn't an era where you could rely on maternity leave, so I was busy juggling work and raising Chase, with help from my mother-in-law. Even after our second son, Nick, was born, my life didn't change much, but I loved my children, and Jim too, of course. My mother-in-law helped me a lot. She always supported me with my work without any complaints. 
She was indeed a wonderful mother-in-law. I resigned from my job to take care of my mother-in-law when she fell ill. I felt indebted to her as she had helped me tremendously in the past. Caring for her was not a burden at all. On the contrary, I was glad that I could repay her kindness even in a small way. After her funeral, the house felt strangely empty. Time passed, and about six years ago, our family received good news. My younger son, Nick, was getting married. His fiancé was a woman his age named Katie. They met at their workplace, just like my husband and I. I was overjoyed. I hoped to live with them and be a good mother-in-law to Katie, just like my own mother-in-law was to me. But Nick said, Isn't my older brother going to inherit this house? And decided to move out. Our property wasn't large in area, but we had a plot of land nearby which we decided to give to Nick. Nick and Katie were thrilled and they built their home there. It's a wonderful house with great space for a family to live, Katie told me. You're always welcome to visit. Of course, you can't take such statements at face value, but I was happy Nick had found such a wonderful young woman. Two years after their marriage, my first grandchild was born. Very energetic little boy, followed by a girl. Nick was doing a wonderful job as his family's breadwinner. I was quite proud and reliant on him. Five years after Nick got married, exactly a year ago from now, my oldest son Chase also decided to get married. He was 41 at the time. We got relieved since we were worried that he would never get married. His wife is a woman named Diana. She's seven years younger than Chase, but is a mature woman in her mid-thirties. We had no concerns about their marriage. All our children were finally settled, and my husband and I were certain we were headed for a peaceful retirement. However, when Chase decided to get married, the first issue that came up was their housing arrangements. We didn't mind living together, of course. This house was intended to eventually be passed down to Chase, and he probably assumed so as well. After revisiting this discussion, my husband told our oldest son, Chase, However, your newlyweds and Diana might feel awkward around us. It might cost a bit, but you could consider living on your own for a while. As a gift for the couple who hadn't had a wedding ceremony yet, we decided to rent out a condo we'd previously bought for investment, charging them less than half of the market rent. We also furnished the place as a wedding gift. This is where the two of them began their new life together. Nevertheless, we're still staying here in this house so they can come back for Christmas. Having the whole family together for Christmas brings me so much joy that I go all out preparing a whole feast. On New Year's Eve night, Chase and his wife arrived first. Welcome back, it must have been cold, huh? I said and greeted them. I greeted them as they came in, exhaling white brass in the chilly air. My husband was relaxing in the living room. While we were all discussing having a drink together and having dinner, Diana was looking around the room. Diana, what's up? Come sit with us. They only got married recently. I figured she might be feeling a bit out of place being newly married. Well, she looked up at the ceiling. Is that a stain up there? Huh? I followed her gaze to where she was pointing. Oh, you're right. I've never noticed. Ignoring my response, Diana moved on to examine a mark on the wall. And there's a scratch here. Oh, that. Chase and Nick did that when they were little. I explained, laughing while looking at the mark on the wall. They had made a bigger mark than they intended during one of their mischievous phases and took turns standing awkwardly in front of it to cover it up. Of course we found out and they got scalded in the end. This was a story from when Chase was in elementary school. It's nice to have a daughter-in-law. In moments like these, I find myself reminiscing about the past and the smallest of things. It was then when I tenderly traced the age scars of my nostalgic memories. How much do you think it would cost to fix this? I was taken aback by the words of Diana. And this stain too. You didn't by chance make a height chart by scratching the pillar, did you? Excuse me? Not understanding what she meant, all I could do was stare at my daughter-in-law. You're giving this house to Chase, right? If you're selling it, it has to be in pristine condition or it won't sell, right? Her words seemed innocent enough. I wanted to scream. What are you talking about? But I discovered that when surprise exceeds its limit, it leaves you speechless. Sandy, Diana. Interrupted by my husband's voice, I returned to him and Chase. What were you two talking about? 
At Chase's question, his wife flashed a smile. We were just looking at the scratches that you and Nick made when you guys were goofy kids. My husband and Chase exchanged nostalgic smiles. But after hearing what she said earlier, I couldn't muster up a smile. The three of them laughed, oblivious to my state. Diana, here you go. My husband offered our daughter-in-law a beer. Ah, Dad. Chase intervened. Diana is actually pregnant. What? Yes. My husband and I voiced our surprise in unison. Well, well, congratulations. They only got married this year. I never thought they'd already have a child. Faced with the joyful news, I too broke into a smile. Maybe she's more attentive to the little things because she's pregnant. Perhaps there was no deeper meaning to her words from before. My wish to be a good mother-in-law covered any doubts I had started to harbor towards her. Soon, our Nick's family also got here and joined us. We all enjoyed the crab that our Nick had sent for the holidays, and after a joyful new year, we went back to our usual daily life. As I hung up the laundry, my breath bogged up in the cold air. It's a chilly year. Suddenly, I started to worry about my pregnant daughter-in-law. On New Year's, my chase told me that his wife, in fact, wasn't feeling very well. Being pregnant is stressing, I know, and that, too, it was her first time. When I was pregnant, I used to confide in my own mother-in-law and get her help with household chores. I felt a strong sense of duty to do the same. I finished hanging the laundry and then headed to the kitchen. I prepared a soup filled with vegetables, which would be easy for my daughter-in-law to eat, and I figured I'd also fry some pork cutlets, which she could reheat in the toaster and enjoy in the evening. I added a salad to complement the lack of vegetables, so I guess this is good enough. I didn't want to force my daughter-in-law to eat, so I decided to call her before cooking. Hello, Diana. How are you feeling? Whenever I call her, she answers after only a few rings. Just usual, nothing special. Although her tone was cold, I approached her gently, asking about her needs. You know, with pregnancy, preparing meals and doing household chores can be hard. Don't hesitate to ask for help if you ever need me. Hmm. Her response was non-committal. Would you like me to make extra dinner and bring it over early? Of course, only if you don't mind, that is. I asked her hesitantly. She said nothing. Maybe she found it hard to refuse, so I also fell silent. I'm sorry if I was assuming things, but I just thought I could help. If you don't want it, I'll forget about it for today. To my daughter-in-law's silence, I said this, intending to end the call. No, I would like to have them. My daughter-in-law responded with a clear voice. I was happy that she relied on me. Got it. I'll bring it to you right away. I responded enthusiastically and immediately went to the kitchen. Are you already preparing dinner, Sandy? My husband asked. I'm taking it to Chase's place. Diana's pregnant and chores must be tough on her. My husband smiled happily at my response. I packed the soup, pork cutlets, and the salad I made into separate containers. They were quite heavy. Seeing me about to head out by bus, my husband offered to drive me instead. I asked him to wait in the parking lot of their apartment building. Having him, an in-law of the opposite sex, around might make Diana feel more uncomfortable than necessary. I didn't want us to be a burden. When I arrived at the apartment, I rang the doorbell on Chase's unit. When I rang the doorbell, the door opened with a creak, but I heard no response. Diana, sorry for dropping by on short notice. Here, have this with Chase, I said, handing her the containers wrapped in cloth. She took the containers without saying a word. Are you feeling unwell? If cleaning or anything else gets too much, feel free to call me. Hmm. She responded curtly. Well, I'll head back then. My husband is waiting downstairs. She nodded slightly, then closed the door with a thud. I felt a bit of distance from her. I know I was the one who asked to drop by, but I even called her earlier to make sure she was fine with it. It wasn't that I wanted her to thank me, but it would have been nice if she had said something more. With a sense of dissatisfaction, I headed back to the parking lot where my husband was waiting. Was Diana happy to see the food you cooked her? My husband said that cheerfully. To alleviate his concern, I responded with a forced smile. Yeah. It was that night. My phone rang. The call was from Chase. I picked it up with a smile, thinking he was calling to thank me for the food. Hello, Chase. Mom, what the hell were you thinking? Right off the bat, Chase raised his voice. What? What's wrong? Y you packed stuff Diana can't even eat. Are you trying to mess with her? 
I was taken aback. That was not my intention at all. Hold on, calm down, please. I didn't mean it like that. Chase was fuming on the other end of the phone. Seeing me flustered, my husband took over the call. Chase, what happened? Talk to me. Thanks to my husband, Chase regained his composure and started explaining why he was upset. My husband listened to Chase's story without saying a word. When the call ended, I looked at my husband with pleading eyes. The food you brought over, the soup had egg in it, right? And the pork cutlet is made with egg, isn't it? Puzzled by my husband's words, I tilted my head. Yes, I did use eggs, but Diana is not allergic to eggs, right? She ate the custard pudding I made when they got married, I said to my husband. I had checked not only for Diana, but also for my Nick's wife, if they had any allergies when they got married. We do eat together when we have them over at the house, so I thought I should know. No, it's not an allergy, but she says she can't eat eggs while pregnant because it might cause the baby to have an egg allergy. And she can't eat raw vegetables either because they might have bacteria. My husband said, looking troubled, There's no way that's true. I've heard such stories, but they're just superstitions. Anyway, Chase says you need to apologize to Diana, my husband explained. It didn't sit right with me, but the fact that she was pregnant held me back from arguing. I understand. I'll call her, I replied. No, it seems she doesn't want to hear your voice, Sandy. Chase says a text will do, plus she says she craves for different food every day, so if you want to help, give her some money. My husband said, clearly uncomfortable, maybe he was right. I nodded, feeling deep regret, so that night I apologized to her through text. From now on, I'll text you on days we can't cook dinner. If you could transfer about $50 for dinner, that would help. I reluctantly agreed to it. I messed up. Although I cooked for her with good intentions, I realized that it's probably best not to stick my nose in too much. From then on, I decided to limit my interaction with my daughter-in-law and helped her only when she asked. Whenever I needed to, I only reached out to her through text and not calls. Occasionally, I'd receive texts asking for dinner money or money to hire a cleaner because she couldn't do it. Every time, I transferred the money. But, as it was quite a hassle to do it frequently, I gave them a substantial amount of money to spend until Diana gave birth. But still, I worried about my grandchild. As the due date approached, I anxiously wait for a call from them. But even after the due date, I never got any call. I know Diana was the one having it the hardest, so I held back and waited for her to reach out. However, about ten days after the due date, I received a text from my other daughter-in-law, Katie. Sandy, has Diana had her baby? She asked, probably preparing for a celebration. I haven't heard anything yet, Katie. I've been waiting for their call because I didn't want them to feel pressured, I replied. And then Katie said, But the hospital they're at induces labor if you're more than a week past your due date. Katie's words made me worried. I guess she's having a difficult delivery and the baby isn't born yet. Or did she fall sick after giving birth? I was restless, so I contacted Chase. How's Diana doing? He read my text right after I sent it. He must be on his lunch break. Diana, she's doing great. I felt relieved at his words. I was worried that she was having a difficult labor, but if she's doing great, then that's good. However, the text that followed had me doubting my eyes. Didn't I mention it was a smooth delivery? The baby is almost a month old now. Come visit us soon. What is he talking about? One month? Of what? I was left puzzled, holding my phone, unable to comprehend his text. I asked my husband. Was the baby born? At my husband's words, I finally understood. The baby was born a month ago? I'm so relieved to hear that Diana had a smooth delivery. And both her and her baby are doing well now. But couldn't they have told me? I also called Nick's wife. She too paused with surprise. Huh? before freezing for a while, as if thinking about something. Anyway, if the baby has been born, we need to celebrate them with a gift. I texted Diana. I heard you had a smooth delivery. Congratulations. I'd like to come over to give you a gift. Is it okay if I visit soon? Diana replied, saying, I'm not feeling well, so please wire me some money. You're not feeling well. Are you okay? I understand. I'll send some money then, and if you don't mind, I would be happy if you could send me a pic of my grandchild. There were many things I wanted to say, but I held back. No, it's not your grandchild, it's my child. I've been doing my best to be understanding, but what she said then ticked me off. Unbelievable. Until now, I'd given her the benefit of the doubt because she was pregnant. 
However, I finally figure that she's been having an attitude, not because she was pregnant, but because she wants to distance herself from us. We supported her during her pregnancy. We should at least have the right to hold our grandchild. My husband texted Chase. Thanks to that, we were able to arrange a visit to meet our grandchild. We agreed to schedule the visit once we could confirm that there were no issues at the baby's one-month checkup. We had mixed feelings towards Diana, but we were genuinely looking forward to meeting our grandchild. Then the day finally arrived. We decided not to send gifts in advance and brought them with us instead. We were worried that if we sent them, she might use it as another excuse to prevent us from seeing the baby. When the promised day arrived, my husband and I headed to the apartment where Chase and his family lived. Can we come in? It's been quite a while since we last came here. Unlike the last time we came here, we heard a baby crying. That brought a smile to my face. Diana, congratulations! She greeted us with a scowl and a slight bow. She was tight, cradling the baby in her arms. My husband was happily chatting with Chase. I approached the baby. I leaned in to take a closer look at the baby's face. She's adorable, I couldn't help but utter. They named the baby girl Maya. Such a lovely little girl. Mom, have a seat, Chase said to me. I sat down next to my husband on the couch and took out the wrapped gifts from my bag. Here you go, these are from us. This one's from me and my husband and this one's from Nick. Katie dropped it off for him and we brought it with us. Chase, make sure to thank Nick, I said with a smile glancing at Diana. However, she didn't return the smile. Please take it back. The room fell into an icy silence with those words. What era are you living in that you expect us to have a relationship with distant relatives? I've been meaning to tell you this, but we don't want you around. Not just me, but my husband and Chase were taken aback by her words. But you know Nick and Katie gave these to celebrate your baby girl's birth. I tried to smooth things over as best I could. A celebration? Did you just say thank them right now? If it's a genuine celebration, we wouldn't need to thank them, would we? We don't need any guests, and we are fine not seeing each other in the future. While we're at it, let me tell you something. I don't want to be involved with you anymore. However, it seemed pointless to argue with her anymore. I decided to stop expecting anything from her, and I calmly stood up. I see. I should have phrased it better. There's no need for thanks. We are leaving these gifts because we're genuinely happy for Maya's birth. My husband and Chase were watching me. From now on, I'll stop meddling with you and Chase. I'll also tell Nick the same. I am wishing you guys all the best to live a wonderful life as a family. To this, Diana replied, That's what we plan to do. After all, weren't you the one who was being nosy from the start? Unbelievable. She's only able to live in a prime location thanks to us. Has she forgotten that? After all the support we offered during her pregnancy. Well then, we won't be nosy anymore. I'm sorry I went out of my line. In anger, I stood up from the sofa. Next to me, my husband also rose, scratching his head in apparent discomfort. Honey, let's go home. Yes. Chase remained silent. He seemed unable to respond to his wife's triumphant smile. Pathetic son. Yes, we'll do fine just by ourselves, so please don't expect us to support you in your retirement years either, right, Chase? Prompted by her, Chase responded, Yeah, that's right, we can't take care of you in your retirement years. Ask Nick instead, he said, looking slightly troubled. Oh, so even my son has turned his back on me. I was so bitter that it was unbearable, but there was nothing more I could say. My husband and I left the apartment in silence. After all, I never got the chance to hold little Maya. I shared the story with Katie, who had come to visit with our grandchild. She was angry on my behalf. That alone provided me some relief. Until then, I had felt guilty, but her words, You did nothing wrong, Sandy, were truly comforting. At that moment, my husband returned. He seemed to have been out somewhere. Welcome back. Where were you? I just stopped by the real estate agent, he replied. The real estate agent? Did something happen? I asked. He just chuckled. Remember that rental we let go for less than half the price? I just asked if we can revert the rent back to the market price. That's what my husband said. I was taken aback by his words. He never seemed outwardly angry, but perhaps he had his own thoughts. Katie, who laughed and said, <laughs> Good one, Dad. We offered them the place at a low price since they were our family, but they're strangers to us now. They'll get a notice in a few days. I never expected my husband to act so quickly. Chase and his wife will definitely be shocked when they receive the notice. I hope they reflect on themselves. For a month after that, we lived as if Chase and his family no longer existed. Even Nick and my husband never even mentioned their names. Thanks to this, we were gradually able to forget our past resentment and anger. One day, we planned to have dinner with Nick and his family. Of course, since we invited them, the dinner is on us. 
Nick was supposed to come get us, and my husband and I were waiting for him in our car. Suddenly our doorbell rang. Oh, I guess Nick and his wife are here, I said to my husband. My husband rose to his feet at the sound of my voice. I headed up to the front door to greet Nick's family who had come to pick us up. Well, you're early, aren't you? I said, opening the door. Then I froze. There before me was Diana, whom we had cut ties with just last month. Diana, I stammered. She didn't give me her usual cold gaze and said she was in worn-out loungewear, completely unfit for going out. Her face conveyed a sense of desperate helplessness. I was wrong, Sandy. I'm really sorry, she said, tears welling up in her eyes, and she sank down on the spot. You are just apologizing now, I replied. Just then my husband heard us and came to the front door. Seeing Diana crouched before me, he looked surprised, but remained quiet, standing silently behind me. The truth is, our daughter has been diagnosed with an illness. I've started working to cover her medical bills, but with the increased rent for our apartment, we can hardly afford food. Could you please lower down the rent to what it used to be? I was taken aback by her tears. An illness? Maya suffering from an illness? I blurted out quickly, squatting down in front of her. Wiping her tears, Diana nodded. That's so unfortunate, I said, standing up. But sorry, we are about to head out to dinner. Can you please leave? Huh? She said, her mouth agape. It must be hard for you guys. I'm wishing you guys the best. Remember to keep your chin up and push through this with Chase. But wait! Diana shot back, glaring at me. I told you, your grandchild is suffering from an illness. Don't you feel any urge to help her out? She snapped at me. I replied with the words she once said to me. She is your child and not our grandchild, right? Figure it out yourself. Diana turned crimson. I almost chuckled at her sight. I am so fed up with her. She would go as far as making her child sick just for money. I knew she was lying. Because just a few days ago, my sister called me. She didn't know about our situation, but she said, I just met Chase. He said his wife and child were fine. He complained that his wife was always sleeping and didn't do much around the house, but with a baby that small, it's understandable, you know? Hearing about them, I was indifferent. And now, just a few days later, her baby is sick, working, and can't even afford groceries. What a miser. Of course my husband is also aware of this. My husband, standing behind me, cleared his throat and spoke up. By the way, we didn't receive this month's rent yet. If you guys can't pay for it soon, we'll need you to leave. Please let your husband know about this for me. Diana turned pale this time. The rents around here are quite high. Living here just on Chase's paycheck is probably a stretch. Sooner or later, they'll surely have to leave. <laughs> then this house, were you going to give this house to Chase? Diana began to lose her composure. That was the plan, but we have no obligation to hand it over to a stranger. Who knows? You you guys might even sell it anyways, and that would be a shame for our ancestors too. Our plan is to have Nick's family to live here. I coldly told her. We don't plan on passing our place to Chase anymore. When we talked about it with Nick's family, they offered to move here while renting out their current place. Nick's wife, Katie, said it would be difficult for us two elderly people to live by ourselves. We planned on having dinner tonight to talk more about this. Diana started ranting. Unbelievable, this is unfair. She was the one who severed ties with us. I wanted to snap back. Look who's talking. What's going on? When I looked up, Nick was standing there. Seeing Diana, he had a surprised look on his face. What brings you here? If you're here to trouble our parents again, please leave. Nick firmly turned her away. Dad, Mom, let's go. With that, we locked the front door. Mom, wait, please. I'm sorry, I'm no longer your mom. I left her and got into Nick's car. It hurt when Chase and his wife cut off ties with us back then. However, I felt a great sense of relief when I told them that I was cutting ties with them now. Later, while we were eating, my husband's phone rang. The call was from Chase. My husband looked at it and turned off his phone. A pathetic middle-aged man who can't even correct his wife. He will probably be under her thumb for the rest of his life. Since we stopped accepting calls from them, Chase and his wife even tried to negotiate their rent through a realtor, but were never going to accept their request. Eventually, Chase and his wife fell behind on rent for four straight months, so we issued an eviction notice. I don't know if they had complaints about that too, but we consulted with the police about the fact that they had been loitering around the house for a while and the police gave them a warning. The cost of living in this area is a bit pricey for Chase's paycheck anyway. I suppose he's moved to somewhere far and now spends a lot of time on commuting to work. But he brought this upon himself. It's not an easy world for a man in his 40s with no job title to switch jobs easily. Later, Nick and his family moved into our house. 
The house they built was quickly rented out, and the rent not only covers their mortgage, but is also an extra income for Nick. We have many rooms, and even though we've become a big family, it's lively and very fun every day. By next spring, my first grandchild will finally be in first grade. Time flies. I hear there are plenty of colorful book bags nowadays. My grandchild said he likes green. My husband and I are looking forward to giving him that as a present. I'm going on a business trip for the next three days, he announced. I wonder how many times I've been left alone on the weekends due to such trips. I'll be late due to overtime, he often said, resulting in countless nights without a family dinner. At first, I thought it was better not to know, but eventually my husband's repetitive actions received what he deserved. My name is Nancy, a part-time housewife at 44. My husband, Paul, is 46 a corporate employee at a certain company. While his work is not bad, he is a man who values his style and appearance above all else. We've been married for 19 years. The year after our wedding, our son William was born, and without any significant issues, our marital life has reached this point. Or so I wish I could say. The reality is that I've spent more than half of our married life being manipulated by my husband's lies. He was always worried about his smartphone. Initially, I thought it was work-related, but I'd occasionally see him typing away and, upon sneaking a peek, it was usually a conversation with someone on an instant messaging app. I didn't pay much attention at the time, but looking back, there were indeed many suspicious points. As his sudden overtime and weekend business trips increased, I began to feel something was off. Several summers ago, my husband, who was supposed to be on a three-day business trip, returned home with a heavy tan. Why are you so tanned when you were supposed to be in a suit for a business trip? I went swimming with a client. It was part of the entertainment. A bit back at his absurd answer, but at the time, I only thought it was unfair that he had a fun time alone, reflecting how stupid I was. My often absent husband used work as an excuse to leave the care of his parents to me. A few years ago, my mother-in-law became disabled due to an injury, and my husband never once offered to accompany her to her hospital visit. He should have some paid leave, but he would blatantly ignore any calls from her. Thus, I'd have to take time off from my part-time job to accompany her. My mother-in-law was a strict person, possibly because she used to be a teacher of traditional calligraphy. I'm rather scatterbrained and prone to mistakes, so I often found myself on the receiving end of her harsh words. To be honest, I didn't like her that much, and I've discussed this with my husband many times. Could you please accompany her to the hospital next week? Your mother would surely want to see you. I would if I can, but there might be a company trip around that time. What? I've never heard about such a trip. Well, it was decided last weekend. I pressed him about this sudden company trip, but he refused to listen. In the end, I had to accompany my mother-in-law to the hospital, yet again. There was a weekend when my husband was surprisingly home. Our son, who was now in fifth grade, had been performing well in his soccer team, so I suggested that we go watch his game together. Every parent watching the children's game lost themselves in the cheer. Our son coordinated well with his teammates, leading the game solidly, and they achieved a splendid victory. Both parents and children were wildly excited about the team's results, and we, as a married couple, joined hands in joy after a long time. The one who approached us at this moment was a mother of a teammate, Patricia. Patricia was a very straightforward woman, and I quickly became friends with her. We would regularly share updates on our children's troubles, home affairs, etc., and began visiting each other's homes more frequently. My husband also got along well with her. Even if Patricia was still at our house when my husband came home from work, we actually felt glad. Our relationship deepened as friends of our marriage. In this way, we continued to have a family-wide relationship, involving not only our sons, but also Patricia's husband. One day, after several years of such interaction, Patricia suddenly started saying something surprising. I know this may sound odd, but doesn't your husband Paul seem to be pretty popular with women? An old man like him? 
No way. Well, the other day, I saw a man who looked just like Paul at a restaurant with a seductive woman. They looked really close. Patricia then gave a detailed account of what she saw my husband and the mysterious woman doing at the restaurant. Even I was stunned by what she described. Although shocked by Patricia's sighting, I was at a loss as to what to do about the sudden suspicion of my husband's infidelity. While I was still speechless, Patricia advised me to gather evidence first. You can't just vaguely accuse him of cheating, you need to confront him with evidence. She then proceeded to teach me several methods to gather evidence of infidelity. From then on, I could only view my husband with a suspicious eye, and our marriage became even more strained than before. Between our son's SATs, accompanying my mother-in-law to the hospital, my part-time job, and housework, I had plenty on my plate. It was a lot to add the task of looking for evidence of my husband's infidelity. But I did things like search his suit pockets when he was out. Then came that day. Although we had separate bedrooms for a long time, when my husband was away, I felt blissful spreading out on the large bed. I decided to do the same that night and went to the bedroom. When I changed the sheets and duvet and moved my husband's pillow to put mine in place, I found a bank book underneath. Upon inspection, I saw that a fixed amount was being transferred every month to the same person from the account under my husband's name. Checking the name, it read, Patricia Brown. Yes, that's right, to Patricia, our friend. He had been transferring about $300 every month. I silently took a picture of it with my smartphone. The next day was the day I had to accompany my mother-in-law to the hospital. Hey, Nancy, are you listening? It seemed I had been spacing out, thinking about the bank book from the day before. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening very well. Well, I saw Paul walking early in the morning. This was my mother-in-law's story. When she was riding in a friend's car through the residential area early in the morning for some errands, she saw my husband walking and entering an unfamiliar house. Who would he be visiting at such an hour? The only houses you could enter early in the morning would be families, right? As I listened to my mother-in-law's story, I recalled what Patricia had told me earlier. Proof of infidelity. I asked my mother-in-law to give me a general idea of the address in that town. Soon, it was crunch time for our son's college entrance exams, and he was attending cram school every day. The cram school fee was set to be automatically deducted from my husband's account, but I received a notice stating the fee could not be deducted two times in a row. I decided to ask my husband about it. The money for William's cram school, they said they couldn't deduct it from the account. Ah, well, can you cover it for now? I'll pay you back later. My husband's behavior seemed odd. Still, I didn't want any conflicts before our son's exams, so I agreed to pay the fee for the time being. But then the same issue occurred the next month, and I had to confront my husband. I'm sorry, I have some debts that need to be settled. I promise to sort it out next month, he said. But by the next month, our son's college entrance exams would have started, and the cram school would be over. I was disappointed that my husband didn't even realize that. Then, our son's exams were successfully finished. He was accepted into the high-profile soccer school he had hoped for. It seems like he didn't make it, I heard. Patricia's son, Robert, had also aimed for the same high school as William, but unfortunately, he didn't pass. He was likely going to attend his backup private school. But according to my son, Robert had stopped appearing at school after the exams. He didn't even show up for the graduation ceremony, and I felt awkward contacting Patricia, so our communication ended there. As my son's high school life settled down, I found myself thinking about what Patricia had told me more frequently. There were several instances of my husband's suspicious behavior, and it was still continuing. At this point, I wanted to clear my mind of all the uncertainty, so I decided to seriously confront my husband. First of all, it was Patricia, whom I had stopped contacting for some time. I contacted her. Then, she told me something shocking. Do you have plans for this weekend? Why the sudden question? This weekend, I'll probably be on a business trip from Friday. 
After confirming that, I called my husband's company on Friday. Hi, I was hoping to know the accommodation my husband is staying at on his business trip. I can't seem to reach him on his cell phone. That's strange. We don't have anyone out on business trips starting today. Feeling as if I knew what was going on, I misled the person from his company and ended the call. That night, I got into a car at a prearranged meeting place and headed towards a residential area. I was determined to obtain solid proof. After midnight, a man who looked like my husband and a slender woman got out of a taxi and went into the house. I quickly took a picture. Zooming in, it was clear that the man was my husband and the woman's face was easily identifiable as well. Gathering one piece of evidence after another, I set the date for the confrontation. It was a few days after my husband returned from his business trip, looking exhausted. I'll be late tonight again because of overtime. Upon hearing my husband's words, I responded with a grin. Ah, our last supper then. Enjoy yourself. There was probably a profound sense of unease in my husband's face from my unexpected smile. He left, scratching his head. Little did he know, stepping into the worst occasion. That night, I hopped in the car again and headed to our designated meeting place. Arriving at the house where I had seen my husband enter with another woman, I rang the doorbell and turned the doorknob. Good evening, mind if I come in? Startled by the unfamiliar voice, the woman who came out asked, Who, who are you? I thought my husband was here. I responded, pointing to a pair of men's shoes by the door. Those belong to my husband. I was shocked to learn she was also married. Indeed, there were other men's shoes. Ignoring her, I barged in, saying, Excuse me. A meal was set up on the table, as if they had just begun to eat. However, my husband was nowhere to be seen. Looking around, I noticed a window leading to the backyard was open. Got him. Those were the words from Patricia outside the window. Yes, my husband had tried to escape through the backyard when he realized I was there. I confronted my husband and the married woman. When did this start? It's been one to two years. Really, it's not that long. Listening to my husband justify that a one to two year affair wasn't long, I responded, 10 years, right? I know it. It's been going on for a long time. With that girl from your office, right? What? What are you talking about? Upon hearing my words, both Sarah and Patricia twisted their faces in confusion. I visited your office and spoke to a few people. You know how there are always some friendly, chatty folks who are happy to spill the beans? Well, they were quite kind to tell me everything. The rumors about you and a girl named Sarah. It seems you two were quite famous. You went to my office, and they told you that? Indeed! When I mentioned that it seems like you have been betraying me for the past 10 years, people were all too eager to share what they knew. My husband, trembling slightly, looked lost, as if he was trying to figure out what he should do next. Seeing him like that, I decided to throw him another curveball. You're shaking, aren't you? How will you manage with what's coming next? As I finished speaking, the front doorbell rang. Sarah, who jumped up in surprise, rushed to the door, and I followed her. The visitor was Robert, my son's soccer buddy, and Patricia's son. When I invited Robert into the house, Patricia, who was already there, looked surprised and wide-eyed. You live nearby with your father now, right, Robert? As I understand it, your parents suddenly fell out for reasons you still don't really comprehend. And you've reconnected with our son. You've been talking to me about it too. Let's clear things up here and now. I said this and looked at Patricia. The woman my husband also cheated with was you, Patricia. Patricia looked at me in surprise and glanced down, unable to meet her son's gaze. Sarah seemed astonished too. So, it began when you met us, right? Pretending to get along with me while both of you were betraying me behind my back. I quickly wiped away my tears and turned to my husband. Why were you transferring $300 every month to Patricia? Was it because you were paying her that we couldn't afford William's tutoring fees? How could you take money meant for our son's education and give it to your mistress? My husband looked shocked that I knew so much, but he couldn't say anything in his defense. In response, Patricia's son Robert said, 
Both my mother and you are despicable, dragging their families into this. Robert said that with a disdainful glare at the two before leaving. It's your fault. You knew you were seeing this woman, and it wasn't about wanting money. You tried to appease me with money, didn't you? Patricia suddenly broke down, hitting my husband's chest as she cried and accused him. My husband had begun an affair with Patricia while he was still seeing Sarah. Exasperated with this, Patricia had started to hint at the infidelity to me, thinking me as suspicious. My husband was trying to placate Patricia, all the while conscious of the gazes of Sarah and me. Sarah seemed angry, her face red, but I felt myself cooling off. It all started to feel ridiculous. Are you all crazy? Am I the only one who has to take responsibility in the end? But fine, I don't need a man like this. You two do as you please. I said that, handed the prepared divorce papers to my husband, and continued. I'll send all your stuff to your parents' house. They'll be charged on delivery, so you'll be hearing from your mother soon. But I... I was wrong. I truly cared only for you. Help me. As I tried to leave, my husband, looking desperate, tried to peel off the two women closing in on him and begged me. Why not ask your mother for help? I replied calmly and headed for the entrance. At the door, I bumped into an unfamiliar man. It looked like the Sarah's husband. I left the house with a smile, knowing that the unexpected return of the husband would stir up another row. Afterwards, we divorced. My husband's long-term misconduct became known not only to his parents, but also to his colleagues, and he was severely reprimanded by his stern mother. His credibility at work fell drastically, forcing him to resign. Patricia, who was his mistress, was handed divorce papers by her estranged husband and seemed to have ended up completely alone. Sarah seemed to have moved somewhere, judging from the sale of her house. The scale of the consequences of my husband's long-term infidelity would probably shock him for the rest of his life. For me, since my husband's family had assets, I was able to receive a substantial alimony. It took courage to tell my son the truth, but he quietly listened to my struggles and told me that he too would do his best to live without any worries in the future. Now, I live peacefully with my son. Stop following my son, you lowlife. He's not here anymore. Three years after breaking off our engagement, I ran into Georgie, my former father-in-law at the hospital. He yelled at me right away. I haven't seen Rick since that day. I managed to reply, but Georgie's scowl didn't change. Don't lie, you stalker. Because of you, Rick had to quit this place. Dr. Nowles, please lower your voice. You're scaring the patients, and this woman is... Other doctors tried to calm Georgie down, but he took his frustrations out on me. Rick suddenly quit this hospital. My son, who never defied me, had to leave because you wouldn't stop following him. Wait a minute. I told you I haven't seen him since that day. Rick left on his own accord. Don't make me laugh. It's all your fault. Because of you, a child of a worthless mother, my son started defying me. My wife was so shocked she left me. You ruined my family. There's no point talking to this man any longer. Not only did he insult my mother, but he also blames me for his son and wife leaving him, completely unaware of how much he had been stifling them. I was furious. Ignoring the red-faced Georgie, I walked away. Hey, we're not done talking. Just as Georgie grabbed my shoulder, a startled voice rang out. My name is Liliana. My life changed dramatically when my father passed away suddenly when I was in high school. My mother became depressed and her health deteriorated. Carrying an indescribable sense of anxiety, I decided to start working right after high school 
to support my family and my younger brother's future. Still, I was fortunate with my work relationships. The law firm where I worked as a secretary during the day had a good atmosphere, and the boss was very kind to me. The pub where I worked at night was run by a couple and frequented by nice regulars. I loved the homey atmosphere and the meals the owner cooked. Then, a few years after I started working, it was an ordinary Friday. How unusual, a young person coming in alone. The pub's clientele was mainly people in their 40s and older. But that day, a man who looked to be in his 20s, around my age, came in alone. While other customers were enjoying their meals and drinks, this man looked unhappy. I even heard him sigh a few times. He stood out because we rarely had customers close to my age, and he had a gloomy aura. From that day on, he became a regular, coming in every second and fourth Friday. He introduced himself as Rick Nowles. Rick usually ate in silence and left after about an hour, but gradually he started talking to me and the owners and stayed longer. Rick continued to visit on those Fridays, making small talk before leaving. I started looking forward to the Fridays when he would come in. About a year after Rick started coming to the pub, he asked me out on a date. I had been working nonstop since high school, and love seemed like a distant dream. It was then that I realized I had feelings for Rick. I was thrilled when Rick asked me out. After a few dates, we decided to become a couple. By then, my younger brother had started college, so I had a bit more time for myself. I didn't know what Rick did for a living until we started dating. He told me he was a medical resident at a private university hospital. That explained why he always seemed so down. His family was full of doctors, and his father, also a surgeon, worked at the same hospital. Apparently, he didn't get to choose where he worked. His father took great pride in their long line of doctors and looked down on anyone who wasn't a surgeon. He also held a powerful position at the hospital. You're destined to take over the surgery department. You should be able to handle this much. His father would say, always demanding more from Rick. Under his father's watchful eye and constant pressure, Rick was struggling. I encouraged him, because I genuinely admired his dedication. You're your own person, Rick. You don't have to follow your dad's path to be a great doctor. You're already working so hard. Thank you, Liliana. Hearing you say that lightens my load. Even though we'd only been dating for a few months, Rick's commitment was intense. He barely had time to rest, always studying. His only free time was on the second and fourth Fridays, and our occasional dates. Despite the immense pressure from his father, Rick never slacked off his duties as a doctor, committed to saving lives. That's why I didn't mind our limited time together. In fact, seeing Rick work so hard inspired me to set my own goals. Boss, I've decided. I'm going to become a lawyer. I've even started studying a bit. Great, if that's the case, I'll support you all the way. If you have any questions, just ask. I'd been considering it for a while, especially since my boss had suggested it before. Now, I was committed to becoming a lawyer. Rick was doing his best to save lives as a doctor. To be worthy of him, I wanted to be helpful to people too. So, I started preparing for the bar exam. I'd seen legal documents before, but studying them made me realize how much I didn't know. 
There were times when I felt like giving up, but Rick would say, Let's keep pushing through together. He never laughed at me for aiming high, even though I only had a high school diploma. Though our goals were different, it felt like we were in this struggle together. A few years after we started dating, Rick, now more confident as a doctor, proposed to me. I was so happy that tears started flowing from my eyes. I accepted his proposal right then and there. But a new challenge awaited me. Meeting his parents. I'd heard that his mother, Catherine, was a kind and gentle person, but his father, Georgie, was quite the opposite. Even Rick, a surgeon, faced immense pressure from his father. So I was filled with anxiety about whether a high school graduate like me would ever be accepted. Still, I want to be accepted. Nervous but determined, I headed to Rick's family home. I had recently passed the preliminary bar exam. Passing this exam proves that you have the equivalent skills of someone who has completed law school, which is a requirement for becoming a lawyer. Knowing I had passed gave me a boost of confidence. When Rick and I arrived at his home, his parents welcomed me warmly, contrary to my fears. Both Catherine and Georgie were smiling, which eased my tension a bit, but that relief was short-lived. Georgie immediately started grilling me about my education and family background. When I answered, he became furious. So you're saying you didn't even go to college? Um, yes. My father passed away when I was in high school. That's irrelevant. Didn't your mother make sure you went to college? Unthinkable. Mirroring into our family is out of the question. Dad, Liliana has been working multiple jobs since high school to support her family. You can't just... Quiet. You have no say in this. Bringing a woman like her into our home. We'd be the laughingstock of the community. Georgie, that's too harsh. Catherine softly interjected, but Georgie was unstoppable. Our family has a long history of producing doctors. Marrying a woman like you would tarnish our reputation. I may be a high school graduate, but I'm working hard to become a lawyer. I've even passed the preliminary bar exam. Desperate for his approval, I mustered the courage to talk back. But Georgie's expression didn't change. So what? You're still a high school graduate. I won't accept a woman like you as my son's wife. Leave this house immediately. I don't remember how I got home. When I came to, I was sitting in my living room. Multiple missed calls and messages from Rick were on my phone. I'm really sorry about today. I'll try to convince them to accept us. I'm sorry for putting you through this. Although many comforting words arrived, my mind was made up. I wasn't ready to be with Rick. The idea of marrying him seemed like a fairy tale. Rick, you're already doing great as a doctor. You'll eventually break free from your father's control. Keep pushing forward. I can't be there to support you, but I'll always be cheering for you. I sent that message and chose to walk separate paths. Three years passed. I was on my way to a particular place, my steps heavy, because that place was the hospital where Rick worked. If I run into Rick, I'll try to smile, but if I encounter Georgie, the thought weighed heavily on my mind. No, no, I'm here for work today. I kept telling myself to stay focused as I walked into the hospital. But then my worst fear came true. Georgie appeared before me. He seemed to notice me almost as soon as I noticed him. Leaving the doctors who were surrounding him, he walked over to me and started yelling with a face full of anger. Stop clinging to my son. 
He's not here anymore. What? Caught off guard by his sudden outburst, I was momentarily speechless. I haven't seen Rick since that day. I managed to say, but Georgie's scowl didn't change. Don't lie, you stalker. It's because of you that Rick had to leave this place. Dr. Nose, please lower your voice. You're scaring the patients. And this lady is... The surrounding doctors tried to calm Georgie down, but he continued to lash out at me. Rick suddenly said he's quitting this hospital. My son who never defied me. It's because you were clinging to him that he had no choice but to leave. Wait a minute, I told you, I haven't seen him since that day. If he left, it was his decision. That's impossible. Rick changed because of you. Even my wife started defying me because of him. Don't blame me for your wife's actions too. Don't you think you're at fault here? My frustration was mounting, and my voice grew louder. The atmosphere among the surrounding doctors was tense, but Georgie continued to look down on me. Don't make me laugh. It's all your fault. My son started defying me because of you, a child of a worthless mother. My wife was so shocked she left me. You destroyed my family. There is no point in talking to this man any longer. Not only did he insult my mother, but he also blamed me for his son and wife leaving him, completely oblivious to how much he had been oppressing them. My anger reached its peak. Ignoring Georgie, who was red in the face, I walked on. Hey, we're not done talking. Just as Georgie grabbed my shoulder, a flustered voice rang out. Stop this at once. I turned toward the voice and saw a middle-aged man standing there. Georgie immediately straightened his lab coat upon noticing the man. Director, thank you for taking the time to come here. I'll make sure today's lecture goes well. Georgie had apparently retired from this hospital a while ago and was now working part-time and giving lectures. He was happily discussing today's lecture topic. After finishing his conversation with the director, Georgie turned to me and said loudly enough for everyone to hear, You're still here. A high school graduate with only one parent has no business being here. Leave immediately. He had just said, We're not done talking. But now he was telling me to leave? Perhaps he wanted to show off in front of the director, but it completely backfired. G Georgie, how dare you say something so rude? Besides, I didn't come here to see you. I came to see her. What? Caught off guard by the unexpected words, Georgie looked stunned. The director shot him a glare filled with anger. She's the attorney handling the lawsuit this hospital is currently facing. How dare you treat her so rudely? A lawyer? Her? Enough! If you continue to be disrespectful, there will be consequences. Wait, director. There must be some mistake. She's just a high school graduate and from a single-parent home. How could she possibly become a lawyer and ruin my family? Georgie seemed to be trying to convince himself that I couldn't be a lawyer, but the director was telling the truth. After that incident, I passed the bar exam and became an attorney. About six months ago, this hospital was sued by a patient's family for alleged medical malpractice. I was called in as the lead attorney, something Georgie, who had retired, was apparently unaware of. Despite the director's warning, Georgie continued to belittle me. The director confronted him fiercely. Didn't you understand what I said? If you're rude to her, you won't get off lightly. D director Georgie looked overwhelmed. Realizing he was in trouble, his face turned pale. The director continued with undeniable authority. Today's lecture is cancelled. 
you will never be invited back as a speaker. Furthermore, you are banned from any further involvement with this hospital. What? what Wait, what do you mean, banned? Don't you understand? You're fired. Fired. At the word fired, Georgie collapsed to his knees. Director, this is the only place I have left. My son and wife are gone, and this is the only place where I feel I have a purpose. Please, anything but firing me. That's not my concern. I'm not foolish enough to employ an unreasonable doctor for such reasons. But what? Without me, the surgery department won't function, right? Is that okay? That's only your opinion. The surgery department will function just fine without you. Let this be a lesson. Overconfidence can be your downfall. The director said only that and left Georgie, who was in shock as he led me away. Afterward, it seems Georgie was officially fired. He was also shunned by his junior doctors and has been living in isolation ever since. He tried to find another job, but his bad reputation preceded him, and he ended up opening his own practice. However, rumors spread that he judged people based on their education and family background, and he couldn't attract any patients. As for me, I won the medical lawsuit. Not only did I gain confidence, but my reputation as a strong attorney in medical issues also grew. During this time, Rick showed up at my law firm. Facing me, he apologized. I heard from the director. I'm really sorry for the discomfort my father has caused you, both three years ago and now. There's nothing for you to apologize for, Rick. Rick looked somewhat relieved. He told me what he had been up to since that day three years ago. Now he's living with Catherine, working at a new hospital, free from Georgie's control, and doing his best every day as a doctor. Listening to Rick's story, I felt a sense of relief. I was happy to hear that both of them had escaped Georgie's control and were living fulfilling lives. Do you remember, three years ago, you told me I had the strength to break free from my father's control? Yes, I do. Those words have stayed with me and gave me the courage to leave my father. They've been with me ever since. I had no idea my words meant so much to you. As I said this with a shy smile, Rick looked at me with serious eyes. I know this might sound convenient given the circumstances, but would you consider starting over with me? Rick, if it were me three years ago, I probably wouldn't have been able to accept. But now I have confidence in myself. Thank you. I look forward to our future. And so we decided to start our lives anew. I'm sure many challenges await us, but I believe that together, as we are now, we can overcome any obstacle.